place the foundation, Moscow, Lubyanka, Secret Intelligence Service. Location, any country in the world. The object, preparation of revolution, diversion, destruction of strategic objects. The name, Vimpel. In the summer of 1996, Vimpo people arrived in Chechnya. The group of special forces was recently recreated by the KGB, but that's not their first mission to Grozny. The officers immediately realized that the situation has radically changed. The troops are gradually leaving the town, passing their functions to the police. Military men try to prevent them from wrong actions. However, their warnings are ignored in the Kremlin. As of spring, the Kremlin was gambling on the Chechen card during the presidential elections. Boris Yeltsin, coming to Chechnya for a few hours during his pre-election speech, promised that the war in Chechnya would end right on Chechen territory. The events in the Republic at war are contradictory and dangerous. The turning point happened early in the morning of August the 6th, when 23 groups of Chechens enter Grozny from three directions. They quickly moved to the center of the town. We contacted the department at that moment. Communication was possible, even telephones, and received information that several department buildings, government house, were surrounded by militants, and there was fierce fighting. There came an order for all the drivers living in the hostel, and there were only drivers, operatives, investigators, commandants. Everybody had to remain in the hostel and was not allowed to move to the region of the department. On August the 7th, at 1800 hours, just from around the corner, there appeared suddenly six men, together with a woman with a camera, filming everything. They asked us not to shoot and to call the chief. One of them, standing out, was not tall, a strongly built, red-haired, introduced himself as a former major of the Special Forces, Goliath. His call sign, as we got to know later, Silver Leaf. No time for thinking. Spare your guys. They asked us to surrender, promised not to kill us, give them all our weapons, and they would let us out of Grozny through the corridor. As they said, 200 militiamen had already surrendered and they led all of them out. <laughs> Vimple officers, who were called masters of special operations, were ready to shoot Goliath and to start the fight. They knew that all those surrendered were killed in spite of all their promises. There was such an idea to shoot first, but then we decided that maybe it was a provocation. If there had been only our group, we would have chosen to start the fight or leave the building, maybe to take in their rear or simply to get out. But we knew that there were lives of other officers, about 85 that were dependent on our actions, and we had to admit that we couldn't start the fight. At first there was such a grumble. Let's surrender, yes, well, who? 
mainly operatives, investigators, commandants, and our subdivision. There were nine of us. Well, as soon as this grumble began, Romashin, the commander of our group, it was, of course, his own merit. He said, the one who will go to surrender will get a bullet in his back. That's all. It was enough. After these words, no one said anything. Everybody knew it's better to be killed by their bullet than by ours. Well, of course, we would shoot. According to official figures, in two days of fighting in August 1996, federal troops lost 50 men killed in action and about 200 wounded. The only unoccupied building in Grozny was the hostel of the Federal Security Service. Vimple officers defended it. It was they who really fought against the terrorists, because only saboteurs could stand up against the rebels on equal terms. The regiment Vimpo was regarded as a special saboteur subdivision of the Foreign Intelligence Service that was the top secret group in the KGB of the USSR. The official birthday of Vimpo is August the 19th, 1981. However, the idea of setting up such a subdivision appeared much earlier, on December the 27th, 1979. On that date, special forces of the KGB, call signs Zenith and Thunder, together with a battalion of Secret Service agents, capture the most important objects in Kabul. The storming of Taj Bek Palace, the residence of Afghan leader Hafiz Amin, was the most important operation. Yuri Drozdol, head of the KGB special forces at that time, being an intelligent officer himself, as well as the head of the KGB Secret Intelligence Service, Drozdov was the first who thought about the need to set up a subversive reconnaissance group. It came about just two hours before the action, before the seizure of Amin's palace, <laughs> this thought. As soon as Grozdov arrived in Moscow, he met with Yuri Andropov, at that time the director of the KGB of the USSR. We reported about the results of the battle in detail. After, when almost everybody had stood up, he too, but we didn't at that moment, and I just said, generally speaking, Yuri Vladimirovich, the time has come to have a regular secret unit to be able to solve such problems. He stopped, but why do you need them? I replied that, for example, we land in the evening or in the morning, we do our job, after us the main forces come in. I meant aviation and so on. And how many do you need? I said at least 1,500 people. Good, get them ready. And that was all, no more words. At seven o'clock every morning, Yuri Drozdov leaves his flat in the center of Moscow and walks. In winter, he usually wears an old officer's pea jacket of Soviet times. He's the last commander of the Soviet Secret Intelligence Service. For 12 years, he was a member of the Supreme KGB Aeropagas which took the most important decisions concerning the country. He was aware of certain facts not known even by Soviet leaders. The story of a legendary intelligence officer began in 1958 in Berlin. The bridge across the Glinicke River in Germany is still well known as the Spy Bridge. It was here on the border between West Berlin and East Berlin Special forces of capitalist and socialist countries exchanged their agents. The first and most famous exchange took place here on Glinicky Bridge. 
It was on that day, February the 10th, 1962, Yuri Drozdov saw his cousin, Rudolf Abel, for the first time. A famous Soviet agent arrested in New York, sentenced to 30 years in prison. At first, we guessed for a long time who Abel was because his real name was different. He took this name because that was his good friend who had already died by that time. And it was possible to determine that he is dealing with the intelligence service. It was such a sign. We began to think how to free him. We didn't have direct contact about release with Americans. Our Secret Service didn't admit that this was a Soviet person. And so it was necessary to find another way. How many other variants can there be? Relatives abroad? If there are no relatives, we need to make them. So Yuri Drozdov became the cousin of Rudolf Abel, a clerk from the GDR, Jürgen Dreves. A long operative game with the Americans began. Dreves, with the help of lawyers from East Berlin, organized correspondence with Abel's lawyer and American Donovan. On May the 1st, 1960, an American reconnaissance aircraft U-2 was shot down over the Urals. The pilot, Francis Gary Powers, made a parachute jump and saved himself. Powers was condemned to severe sentence. There was a hope to persuade the Americans to free William Fisher, that was the real name of the Soviet agent Rudolf Abel. And the fight for him went on till 1962. At last they agreed, for the Soviet agent, the USSR was ready to give away not only Powers, but two American students arrested for espionage in Kiev and Berlin. It took about a year to decide when and where this exchange would take place. All the negotiations with the Americans went on through Yuri Drozdov. Only once, on February the 10th, 1962, on Blinicky Bridge, he met his so-called cousin. On February the 12th, 1962, William Fisher, internationally known as Rudolf Abel, left for Moscow. From 1975 to 1979, Yuri Drozdov worked on the territory of the main Cold War opponent of the USSR in the United States of America. Since the beginning of the organized struggle against the USSR, it became clear that every Soviet official abroad would be closely watched by Western secret services. So, Every official going to the United States in the past and now is still something like an object of hunt for the secret services. Delicate, interesting, gentle, secret, or insolent. Such a hunt took place in New York in 1978. Yuri Drozdov worked in the representative office of the Soviet Union at the United Nations Organization. It was a slight attempt of the New York FBI to use their possibilities to study and possibly recruit Soviet officials. Drozdov and his colleagues elaborated a combination to check the FBI men. An official of our representative office, as if by accident, left a file with secret documents in a car. The people who did this job found a lot of information about some features of American visual observation and about the work of the FBI subdivision against Soviet representatives. Officials in the United States, particularly in New York, the style of work of the American Special Services was never original. Their official on duty in the garage immediately noticed a file in the car. 
The documents contained secret information. But the main thing was that the absent-mindedness of the Soviet representative was regarded by the American Special Services as a hint at cooperation. The owner of the car verified the suggestion of the FBI men. He returned to take the file and easily reacted to its disappearance. The game began. Well, then we found a letter inviting us to meet and saying, you must know the features of our work. We cannot meet with you. Answer in a letter, what do you want? They replied that they were interested in questions of political information, overall situation, and so on and so forth. And we answered that we could help them, but not work gratis. We wrote that we had specially prepared the information using open materials, packed it up, and left it inside the car. Soviet agents let the Americans know the time and place to leave the money and the next task. The Americans fulfilled all the conditions. At the fixed time, our United Nations representative took the cigar-shaped case with dollars and a list of questions that were of interest to the FBI. Well, the most amusing of all in the story was when we sent this money to Moscow. Moscow refused to accept it. There wasn't such an item allowing them to take this money. They wrote, please don't send us any such money anymore. In general, this continued for some time. They insisted on a meeting. We replied that we shall try to meet with them and asked them to have a sign if they were ready and agreed with our suggestion about the place. We told them where, on which road sign to mark their conventional sign to tell us that they were ready and accepted our conditions. They were so glad that on the sign they placed a dot as big as a fist. Well, this is reconnaissance. This is a battle. This is a little episode in the art of deception by both sides. And everyone thought he was the winner. The main success of the New York agents in 1978 was the valuable information about American movements in Afghanistan. The CIA planned to discredit and perhaps overthrow the Taraki socialist regime recently established in Kabul. The long-term plans of the American Intelligence Service were aimed at the Asian republics of the USSR. Yuri Drezdrow reported to Moscow about this. A year later, in December 1979, Drezdrow became the head of the Intelligence Service and the head of the KGB Special Forces during the storming of the Amin Palace. Later, Drezdrow founded the Special Division Cascade. Dozens of military aircraft landed Cascade troops on July the 25th, 1980. They operated in all the important Afghan provinces. Their main task was to collect information and conduct, record special operations. It was rather difficult to organize the Secret Service in Afghan conditions. You see, the matter was that we found ourselves in thriving feudalism, a kind of Middle Ages. Nothing about it was written in books. Nonetheless, a month later, the Cascade officers received reliable information from their own sources. In the reports, they mentioned some unknown mountain base on the border with Pakistan. So here we hooked the Turabura. So there was uh, some base, a lot of weapons, a lot of explosives, and so on. But neither the army nor we could imagine what we should see later. Well, our opinion was, what base can there be? Some about double grottos, several caves, where something is kept, masked, and talks about giant caves, artificial tunnels. Yes, it was taken with some doubt. And particularly somewhere at Turabur, or I don't know how else, probably there are different translations, now it's called Turabur, but in general, the essence, it's the same place. Neither Pochira, Gama, or Turabura was spoken about. They said, there, on the mountains there. And when we reported to the party advisor, the senior advisor in the region from the committee, 
he was surprised and said that we were disappointed that it was misinformation because numbers impressed not 60 or 100 200 people they were counted by the thousands it was said that there in that space thousands couldn't get in where the dushmans from but dushmans they were the same civilians but on the appointed time they took up weapons and fought and it was rumored that there were American instructors there. I mean, it was a buzz, but instructors from the United States, I never saw them. But basically, all the sources claimed that there were Chinese instructors, sometimes Pakistanis. From the USA, from France, from England, there were advisors. They were organizing them, structuring. The enemy had a lot of faces. It wasn't such a portier. Actually, portiers were simple executives. The Division of Brigade 66 in Jalalabad, according to the latest information from agents, Dushman from the Portier took hostages to the ravine Tora Bora. The operation was planned for the beginning of October 1980. The Cascade officers would secretly penetrate into the ravine first. They would find the hostages. After that, the whole brigade would storm the base. On the appointed date early in the morning, the column moved to the opposite direction from Tora Bora. We invented and gave the misinformation that we were beginning the cleanup operation. We even told the Afghans who took part in preparing and gaining information about the hostages, told them that, that no, no, we're not, but to clean up some settlements and we cleaned up the settlements in a pointed manner. In general, it was hard, hardly a cleanup. It was not the same that is now called cleanup in Chechnya. That was like defile. And this maneuver and just this misinformation helped us to make a night attack. And they had no time to mine the roads and communication. At about five to six kilometers, we came across this canyon and we realized that the equipment couldn't pass through it. It couldn't move further. We dismounted and I asked Mirnov, the head of the brigade, will you give me a foot convoy? I cannot, it's not coordinated. I can't let the people go with you. We had conferred all together while well, we decided to fulfill the mission ourselves. And our small detachment, including the Afghans, moved forward to our target. At that time, helicopters circled over the Tora Bora ravine, and the brigade leaders didn't know how strong the base in the mountains was to be stormed, so artillery and army aviation skirted every winding of the ravine. Everything began with the fire preparation, artillery and aviation. Then the Afghan subdivisions began moving forward. 70 to 50 meters behind were our subdivisions along the heights. During the entire maneuver, there was continuous fire resistance from the Dushman side. commanders knew the locality well. While moving forward, the Dushmans continued fire resistance. The battalion of Captain Uruz Matov, he felt the fire resistance was too strong, so they were helped by fire. But on the whole, I say, subdivisions acted and showed they had been trained such as they marched with a song, but it wasn't so. Can you imagine about 80 helicopters, that is 40 pairs of choppers because they work in pairs? They're moving in nurses while bombing. During this time, we run zigzag as far as possible, 15 to 20 meters, and there was a dead zone before you reached the foot of it, of course. We suffered losses. Well, at night, we seized this height. 
At dawn, the Cascade officers found hostages in one of the caves. They realized how the separate Dushman's bands managed to hold their defense for two days. There were pillboxes with rock doors in case of bombing. Tuarbora. It's a fortified location. It's their base, very large, as Pakistan is close, about four to five kilometers away. This is a mountain range, a very narrow ravine at the beginning. Then five to 800 meters, it widens. And that's where their base is. And the heights turn out to be very steep. And the tier defense is made around from top to bottom. And there is a communication system by passages. To one side, there was an American Army field hospital, right? I could never appreciate it, but the battalion commander did because he had more skill in these sciences. The ammunition depot was placed separately, the mine depot separately, the grocery depot separately. Everything was hidden very well and a most open. Where the hell are we? 442 mortars, 118 large caliber machine guns, 28,000 mines, a tremendous quantity of cartridges, grenades. We blew all this up. In October 1980, Soviet Army subdivisions and special forces of the KGB stormed Tora Bora for two days. The Americans in 2001 for five days. And according to our intelligence service information, the U.S. special forces failed to penetrate into the base. On August the 19th, 1981, during the closed meeting of the Central Committee of the CPSU and the Council of Ministers signed the law on the foundation of the KGB Special Force Subdivision, Vimpel, on the base of Cascade Division. It was the next quality stage. And it grew up, of course, on two, if we can say so, platforms. The first platform was the event in Afghanistan, which proved the need of specific work on foreign territory in contact with local population, deep into local population territory. And the second was continued expansion, the appearance of groups and forces for special operations abroad, and even on the territory of the Soviet Union. They often were entrusted with very serious operations. Well, you know, for example, the operation of the liquidation of the president of the Congo, and so on. You see, in those countries, they recruited the best officers of the special forces, and such a specific need appeared to create a counterbalance, in other words, something like a neutralizer. Training continued approximately from five to seven years, and it was real training. He could graduate from the Red Banner Institute of Intelligence Service, for example, the Diplomatic Academy. Besides, he studied at least one foreign language, or even two. Moreover, strong scuba diver training, and in addition, constant intensive airborne training. They did a lot of parachute jumps. The task of the Vimpel Division was to carry out operations in any country of the world. In other words, to work in the tropics, deserts, or jungle. The officers were trained on Cuba and in Vietnam because the special forces of those countries had acquired sufficient fighting experience. We were taught what herbs and animals were edible. Take snakes, for example, or raw meat. If it was poisonous or not, we studied everything, guided by the gifts of nature. After the operation is finished, you have dinner. This is your portion of food for the whole day. It's eaten this way. Open the polyethylene packet. It's pressed nutritious powder. Tasty. Now, guys, let's go. Mother will remember you. It was like this. A group of three or four soldiers had to destroy an enemy battalion without suffering any losses. They tried to teach these things well. 
They succeeded in a way. Yes, we started it too. We went through the Bruno spiral in swimming trunks, through barbed wire, we did it. We walked on glass, yes, we walked on glass. First, we were amazed by the technique and methods of movement, very exotic for us. To squat and move, to move using palm and stomach, to move bending. So this technique is not typical for us, but we didn't have it. In fact, it wasn't typical for us, but it was ordinary for those countries. The second thing that we were struck by, me particularly, was their technique of masking. They had brought it to perfection. There can be a half a meter between you and an intelligence officer, but you'll never guess that he's there. You can see it now in the movies, and now our soldiers take the paste, smear something on. Well, that's crap. Real specialists, I know it. Any ray, human eye reflects light. Let's take, for example, a face, you see? But what do you do before masking? They smear faces with plant juice, the face gets dull, reflects nothing, and only after that they apply all this stuff, ashes, green, all these things, which is called natural camouflage. Here are some examples of combat masking. Have you noticed anything? Vitya, stand up. What have you smeared on? In 1987, we came to Nicaragua. There was our guy there who told us that two Nicaraguans wanted to show us how they could shoot. Imagine that, us heroes. Five people will go and learn from the Nicaraguans. And when we came there and we saw them shooting, at once, we threw away all our ambitions and just told him, teach us. He took up the gun, loaded it, shot at targets, reloaded the gun, and hit two targets at once on the back side. So the two hits were right at the chest. He did it in three seconds, I would say. The shooting was unique in itself. We combined the shooting technology of the Nicaraguans with the Kadrichnikov system, and we also added tactics of the American Special Forces for fighting inside buildings. And as a result, we got the Vimpel technology. Work is study. So all their training, as well as the illegal agents, consisted of systematic exercises carried out from year to year. Well, September is coming. From mid-September till the end of May, we have continuous training. Moreover, the task is common, simultaneously, political, military, and economic. And it went on from year to year in such a way to make this cooperation the barest necessity. After the best soldiers from the Special Forces Division were recruited, they were trained for three years in order to satisfy the requirements of Impel officers. They had to be not just super soldiers, but first of all, intellectual agents. The first years of training showed that Vimple could carry out any mission and subversive acts all over the world. It could be anywhere. Yes, the regiment consisted of so different specialists that it was possible to form a group and in any country and make a revolution. In the sack half of the 80s, Vimpel really worked in some foreign countries. Vimpel officers founded similar regiments in Angola, Mozambique, Afghanistan. They went to Nicaragua and Vietnam. It was officially called a probation period or advising activity. We will hardly ever know what else Vimpel officers had done in other countries.
Then Vimpo really developed enough and was ready to solve any serious problem, and it really did. And many examples prove it. Somebody is allowed to know about them, somebody not. In 1988, Vimpo officers began to work on the super-secret operation of atomic power stations. During several years, they conducted maneuvers at almost all the atomic power stations of the USSR. The KGB chairman reported to the Council of Ministers that all the nuclear objects that Vimpo had worked on were conditionally liquidated. The state leaders refused to believe this, and a lot of them didn't sign the report, which discredited the state security system. Then Vimpo suggested to carry out demonstrative maneuvers at the atomic power station Udomo. All the security services of the Tereskaya region worked against the group. They knew the target and time of the saboteur's penetration. Counterintelligence agents were even told whom they had to catch. In Udomo, the special regime was put into force. But even the strongest counterintelligence measures could not save the station. Using different legends, Vimpo men penetrated first into the town and then into the atomic power station. They outwitted the security services and properly foresaw the situation. Thank God it was only training. This is training, not a competition. There are no losers and no winners. We gain experience, found the weak points, and try to eliminate the defects. They said there was a steam locomotive with a missile. In any case, you won't find it. So try, twitch, and we'll look at your skills, how you can organize, how you can come in contact with the people, and so on. Actually, you have got no chance. Start working. The first we can say about Vimpo is that it's an intellectual subdivision. Yes, we all gathered in an old house. You know, the dampness of old beams, yes. And we began thinking, asking each other, what is it? What does it look like? And the first answer was, an awfully heavy thing. But if it's heavy, then something is wrong with the wheels. They're not like wheels of an ordinary train. And thus we created the image of a thing we had never seen. The most interesting thing was that we found this object 14 days later, and it looked exactly like we had imagined, including all the special features we had thought of. The computed and conditionally liquidated by Vimpo men, unusual train, was a top secret object of the Soviet Army. The USSR guided it thoroughly, as it was the only battle railway missile complex in the world. Four years later, I met one of our umpires. He said, do you know that five research institutes have worked on the results of your exercises? They specially modeled the situation of the elimination of that train, especially destroyed the model. It was something more than simple training. It was an element of state defense improvement. In 10 years, beginning from 1981 till 1999, Vimpel officers examined all these strategic objects in the USSR. Cooperation between Vimpel and illegal agents was the main feature of the group. That was determined by General Dresdol. He didn't need ordinary special forces, which would appear accompanied by helicopters roaring and shooting right to the end of the operation. That should be a regiment able to come quietly and analyze the situation, fulfill the operation quietly, and leave. So it happened in 1990. Vimpel was ordered to depart promptly to the Caucasus to take part in the wide-ranging maneuvers of Chesma. The training was arranged as a counterbalance for the NATO maneuvers Arch Bay Express. As soon as we studied the plan of this training, we immediately found a way to keep them under observation. It was possible to arrange observation at the counter front, expecting their approach to the border of our Transcaucasus and to the border of Bulgaria. Another possible variant was to observe their actions being inside their military disposition. We chose both variants. And this helped us to make certain movements. By the way, according to American scenarios, there were to be two nuclear attacks planned at Bulgaria 
and at the Transcaucasus. From the general information we got to know, I mean the secret information, this activity in the second half of the 80s was not only concerning the Caucasus, but also Asia, the Baltic Republics, let's say, the preparation stage, the stage of penetration, active penetration into the territory of the USSR. And this process was already actively developed in the second half of the 80s. Bimbo officers arrived in the Caucasus. As for information from the residents, one foreign Muslim terrorist organization came into contact with a nationalist organization, the Sword of Islam, functioning in the Caucasian republics. The messenger was an engineer. It was known from our foreign agents that Western special services were planning to send an emissary to the Soviet Union. He was to give the engineer instructions on terrorist acts. The emissary was arrested. Instead of him, a Vimpo agent was introduced inside the Islamic Nationalist Organization. Well, today we can say that it was difficult to call all this process training in the classical style. It would be better to call it such a labor rent made especially on real facts and events that happened in the region. We worked with real agents with real illegals and sometimes with the real adversary, then we call them emissaries. And dozens and hundreds of them at that time penetrated into the territory of the Caucasus, into the territory of Georgia, Azerbaijan, Dagestan, Checheno, and Bushetia. The terrorist base was situated in the region, difficult of access. It took five days to penetrate there. Meanwhile, people in the region, anyhow connected with extremists, had been arrested. And we had to hurry. The headquarters of the Muslim Nationalist Organization was on an island. During the examination, divers discovered a man whom they had seen earlier with the engineer. The messenger was going to the island. He could warn the terrorists about the arrest, so he was captured right in the sea. It was getting more dangerous to postpone the storming of the base. We investigated the base, found the terrorists and the hostages. We released the hostages, destroyed the base, so our mission was over at this stage. I want to say it was finished with the full elimination of the base of terrorists, yes. It happened just at that place. The KGB shot a film about the maneuvers Chesma. In the spring of 1991, the chairman of the KGB, Khrushchev, agreed with Yuri Drozdov's suggestion to show it to the deputies of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR. We asked for permission, yes, to show it for the group of deputies, Sharon, who was leading the work of the Commission for Defense and Security of the Supreme Soviet. They closely watched the screen, the content of the film. And so, after the showing, we asked them about their opinion, if they wanted to say anything. Most of them simply kept silent. But Sharon said, don't you think too many unnecessary things are stressed here? We answered him. The guidance of the committee was present. The vice chairman of the Committee of State Security was there. I had to answer what we consider that what had been shown was to be very serious. And so, we wanted the Commission to appreciate the situation seriously. No, that's impossible. All right, we say. The only purpose was not to allow the civil war to extend north. And believe us, 
as soon as it concerns your children, your wives and personally you, you will quickly change your position. The showing finished with such words. Unfortunately, they began to mathematize us, as if we were confusing minds, exaggerating so-called national problem. Well, in general, we were lashed. We were lashed very good. But unfortunately, the practice verified, no later than in two years began, of all you know, what continues till this day in the Caucasus. The film Warning was shown to the deputies of the Supreme Soviet in April 1991. On June the 3rd, the Chief Department of C of the KGB in the USSR, Major General Grosdo, retired. Two and a half months later, Vimple was to celebrate its 10th anniversary, but the festival did not take place. It wasn't the right time for the celebration because of the putsch on August 19, 1991. Then happened just what Yuri Grozdov and the Vimpo had warned about. In former Soviet republics, internecine grew into civil wars. In 1994, when the subversive reconnaissance division Vimpo already did not exist, the war in Chechnya began. The Federal Security Service remembered about legendary Vimpel in 1996 when the war was at its high point. The group was recreated and sent to Grozny. And now one of its divisions stood against the terrorists in the center of Chechnya. On August the 8th, 1996, 500 more Chechens arrived in Grozny. In the morning when the battery had almost died, the Vimpel men could again connect by portable two-way radio with the Federal Security Service Department. They said, wait, Federal Forces Column has already gone to help you. It wasn't yet known in the department that the column had been liquidated in full near the central market. By that time, many of the hostile defenders were killed. Almost all were wounded and the building was on fire. The Chechens drove a tank to the hostel over which the Ichkarian green flag was fluttering. Then at about four o'clock, we heard the shout, al Akbar, and we heard the sound of a diesel. In that moment, our competitive spirit dropped as we understood they were moving some material. On the eighth, yes, it was the eighth, we realized there was nothing to do here. Mikhail, Mish, let's run away from here. There's so many of us. The whole crowd, he said, 90 people. If we meet anybody, we can annihilate the whole detachment. Well, yes. We went to the operatives and asked who was the chief. They showed us one lieutenant colonel. He had been wounded. He said that we could not surrender. At about 2 o'clock at night, FSS people began leaving the hostel. Vimple was the last to leave the building, but he did not have time to do it. As I knew later on, they divided into separate groups, and order came. The first group, about 25 or 30 men, passed by quietly. Then security service officers, but the second group was wiped out. They had already felt something, had put their machine guns ready, and shot everybody, about 25 people. They all remained there, lying not far from the hostel. There were 14 people left inside the hostel, eight officers from Vimple, and six FSS operatives. Nobody in the Kremlin knew about it. On the 9th of August, President Boris Yeltsin was inaugurated for the second term. The capture of Grozny had been thoroughly planned by Chechen armed forces to this very date. Russian federal forces in Chechnya tried to take the lead over the situation and had prepared a special operation dated on the 6th to the 8th of August to destroy the Chechen terrorists. However, Maskhadov and Basayev had been aware of these plans and ruined the operation. Till the 9th of August, all the commandant's offices, blocks, military units had been captured. The terrorists were celebrating their victory. They were robbing and killing the citizens. We have no place to hide. Here's my house. Save us, please. Save us. Late on the night of the 11th of August, the completely burnt hostel was deserted. Vimple had decided to leave the town. Two officers were detached from the group.
to put it right, Valeria and me, we had passed our group because of this we separate from our group. So three of us had to move together. So we turned, we laid down for half an hour just to have some rest as we were very stressed. There were clouds and it was drizzling. There along the government house, there was a trench. Well, not a trench, but some entrenchment as long as the whole building. So I said, Valeria, we'll dive into this hole. I'll crawl the first and check if there are mines there and so on, and then you'll follow me. And as we got to know later, this strange action, which had not been planned, as we were to move all together, but it seemed like just this was the conclusive thing that helped us to get out of here, to survive. I had lost my voice and I asked, Valera, can you speak? And he said, yes, I told him to shout. And he started to shout, hey, guys, Federalists, we're yours, don't shoot, because we needed to call ourselves before hanging out, so I mean, but they didn't understand. We said, we're from the hospital. They're still asking from the DGB. So well, Valera said, no, we are Shiites. And he answered, all of those in the hospital are dead. I felt so hurt, why dead? We're alive, why dead? And he said, you, two days ago and immediately realized that all of our group had already been written off. But they all survived from the occupied center of Grozny without any losses, because their name was Vimpo.